Jami is currently a third year PhD student at, uh, at Washington State, uh, Washington University, St. Louis. His research interests in computer networks, including optimization, edge computing, ML in network systems. So the stage is yours. You'll give a talk titled Adaptive Age of Loading of Image Classification Under Rate Limit. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so thanks for the great introduction. So uh, without further delay, let's just get started. So can you all see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Great. Uh, so hi, everyone. Welcome to this presentation. I'm Jamin from Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm here to present our work entitled Adaptive Edge Offloading for Image Classification on the Rate Limit, which is a joint work with Rui Qiwan, Dr. Ayan Chankarbarti, Dr. Rock Garen, and Dr. Chen Yan Lu. Uh, the problem we investigate in this work arises from an edge computing setup. Specifically, there are multiple smart cameras that capture images of sequences of objects. The smart cameras are also responsible for classifying these images in real time to trigger subsequent actuations. For example, generating an alarm upon, certain, upon detecting certain types of objects. The sequences of objects and corresponding images are allowed to have arbitrary structures and therefore may exhibit complex arrival patterns. Uh, the cameras use onboard weak classifier to perform image classification as they only have limited computational resources. Apart from the cameras, we also have an edge server with more computational resources capable of running a strong classifier. The strong classifier is more resource consuming, but usually gives more accurate classification results. The cameras can therefore decide to offload images to the edge server when the weak classifier output has low confidence. However, to avoid overloading the edge server or the network that is shared by all cameras, cameras are not allowed to offload every image. They are limited in both the long-term and short-term rates at which they can offload images. These limitations are realized through a token bucket that is present at each camera. Uh, the token bucket is applied as a standard mechanism for regulating the traffic of offloaded, of offloaded images. It does so by relying on tokens that are used as the credits for making offloading decisions. Specifically, one token is paid for each image offloading, and the token bucket works like a bank account that allows cameras to save R tokens every second. However, the cameras are not allowed to save more than B tokens to avoid a transient overload of the network or the edge server. The image offloading procedure introduces a trade-off. On the one hand, offloading an image offers an immediate reward since the classification result of the strong classifier is potentially more accurate than that of the local weak classifier. On the other hand, the token consumed for this offloading decision may prevent future images with higher reward from being offloaded. The goal of our work is to find an optimal policy that investigates this trade-off and maximizes the overall classification accuracy of the system, considering the token bucket constraints. For modeling purpose, this is approximated using a standard objective function in reinforcement learning, which is formulated as the sum of discounted offloading reward over an infinite horizon. Uh, there are three key challenges for developing a solution. First, the immediate reward from offloading an image depends on the confidence of both classifiers, but must be estimated with only the weak classifiers output. Second, the solution also needs to predict future reward since the trade-off we introduced involves comparing the immediate reward against the impact on losing future offloading opportunities. However, the future reward is a complicated function of both the arrival pattern of future images and their associated classification confidence. Finally, the offloading policy should not require complex, complex computations since it must be performed locally in real time. We developed the following solutions to tackle those challenges. First, we propose using the confidence metric of weak classifier uh, output to estimate the immediate offloading reward of each image. Specifically, we use a standard regression model in machine learning to fit a mapping from the confidence metric to the offloading reward. Second, we apply deep reinforcement learning to handle complex image arrivals and estimate expected future reward. This is because to learn the dependencies within the input processes, 
the policy needs to account for a history of image arrivals, and deep reinforcement learning was proved effective in handling such high dimensional inputs. Specifically, we use a deep Q network, DQN, to estimate the Q values, which are essentially the sum of immediate reward and discounted future reward at each state. Uh, the state of our system is defined as a combination of the current token bucket state, a history of local classification confidence, and a history of image inter-arrival time. Finally, since the local computation resources available to the smart cameras is limited, we construct DQN as a five-layer perceptron with 64 units for each layer. Our evaluation consists of the following components. First, towards emulating the complex input processes, we create image sequences with synthetic correlation patterns. We investigated correlation patterns in both image arrival rate and consecutive classifier confidence. Second, to quantify the performance of DQN, we compare it to three baseline offloading policies. The first one is a lower bound policy that offloads our percentage of images with the highest offloading reward estimates. Uh, the, lower bound, uh, the lower bound policy is not feasible, but it marks the best possible performance we can hope to achieve. The second is a fixed threshold baseline that attempts to offload the same subset of images, but needs to respect the, uh, the bucket size constraints that may, uh, and may not offload some images due to the lack of tokens. The last policy is an MDP policy that shares the same objective with DQN, but is oblivious to possible correlation patterns and assumes a constant image arrival rate and RID distribution for classification confidence outputs. We demonstrate the performance benefit of DQN and show its low computational overhead using an edge computing testbed. We consider a token bucket configuration with a token rate of 0.1 and a bucket size of 4. Uh, in the first set of evaluations, we focus on image sequences with correlated classification confidence. In this figure, the x-axis and y-axis represent uh, time and image reward estimate, respectively. Each dot represents an image arrival and is color-coded according to the offloading decisions made by DQN and the MDP baseline. Uh, as is shown in the figure, we create image sequences that toggle between subsequences with high and low reward estimates. The, feature, the figure shows that DQN learns the correlation structure and consequently adapts its offloading policy according to the range of each subsequence. When DQN expects high reward images in the near future, it behaves more conservative than MDP and generally offloads images with higher reward estimates. Conversely, when DQN anticipates future images with low reward, it behaves more aggressively than MDP by offloading images with relatively low reward to avoid wasting tokens. Uh, we next control the correlation level of image sequences through two parameters of the synthetic correlation we created. In these figures, each point reports the average top five loss which is a standard image classification error metric with lower values indicating that the model performs better. As we can see, DQN consistently outperforms MDP and the baseline uh, as we fix one of the controlling parameter and change the other. Correlation decreases as the two parameters increase, which is why DQN and MDP perform similarly when either is, is large enough. In the second set of evaluations, we switch to investigating correlation in how images arrive by alternating between periods of high and low arrival rates. As before, DQN's better performance lies in its ability to adapt to changes in arrival rate. In particular, when arrival rates drop, as is shown in the right-hand side of the figure, DQN becomes more aggressive in deciding which images to offload by selecting images with lower reward estimates to avoid wasting tokens. Similarly, we observe that DQN consistently performs better than the other policies across different levels of correlations. Uh, finally, we demonstrate the runtime efficiency of DQN by implementing it in an edge computing testbed that involved a Raspberry Pi as our camera. 
a Wi-Fi connection as our shared network and a mid-range server equipped with a GPU as our edge server. As is shown in the figure, the runtime overhead of the DQM policy is minimum compared to the processing time of the weak and strong classifiers and the network transmission time. In summary, in this work, we developed a DQM-based approach to optimizing offloading decisions in an edge computing setting and demonstrated that a lightweight DQM model is capable of learning complex input processes, including correlation in both image arrivals and classifier outputs, as well as the impact of token bucket state and its constraints to future offloading decisions. Thank you, I will stop here and I will be happy to answer any questions. Oh, perfect, thanks a lot, uh, Jami, for the very nice talk. Uh, so if you, no one don't mind, then I'll just uh, start with my own questions. So I'm actually sure. interested in page six, where you talk about, if you go back to page six. Mm -hmm. So uh, the thing is that you have this, uh, this, uh, this correlations, the first sub bullet point, are the correlations in image classification confidence and or arrival patterns. So mm -hmm. one thing that is not very intuitive from my side is that, uh, that is this somewhat like a, like artificial thing that you created, or can I have some, some real example to demonstrate that yes, the classification confidence has a relation with arrival patterns. So this is unclear for my side. Can you explain a little bit about, about how this uh, synthetic sequence can be mapped to the real world setup? Okay, sure, sure. Uh, so actually this, this is a very good question and this is one of the biggest challenges in developing uh, evaluation uh, for our work. Uh, so in our work, the synthetic correlation we created is, uh, uh, the, cre the correlation we created is purely synthetic. So it's just using some uh, thing that is uh, purely artificial. So if you look at the figure I just demonstrated, uh, the y-axis in this figure represents the a uh, confidence uh, estimate of each image. So if the uh, image, if, if the uh, 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 if the weak classifier is, is more confident, it potentially means the weak classifier can handle the image uh, classification well by itself. If it's not confident, it usually means that this image needs to be offloaded to the uh, edge server. And uh, in this figure, we can see that the correlation we created is purely synthetic. There is nothing uh, special about this correlation. And the reason we do it is because uh, currently there, uh, we could not identify a, 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 a data set that, con that contains natural correlation. Uh, and uh, it, it has a nice sequence of images that contains natural correlation for image classification. So as a result, we have to uh, turn to this kind of synthetic correlations and uh, finish our evaluation using this kind of uh, sequences. And uh, switching to more natural uh, correlation is definitely a very good idea. And uh, but we just uh, put, uh, delayed that to future reward. Uh, sorry, the future works uh, uh, in, in, in this project. And uh, 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 one thing to think about this is that you can potentially map this kind of evaluations to real world evaluations. If you uh, think about it, uh, there can be some cases where uh, the confidence is dependent, for example, in the uh, in the uh, light lighting conditions, when the lighting con condition is good, potentially the weak classifier is more confident. And when the lighting condition is bad, potentially the weak classifier is less confident. And uh, this kind of uh, situations can easily be mapped to the synthetic correlation we created. So hopefully it helped demonstrate the flexibility and efficiency of DQN in handling this kind of uh, complex arrival patterns of the images. Uh, and can, does that answer your question? Yes, perfect. Thanks a lot. So, uh, so the maybe we have uh, one very short question if there's an audience wants to ask. Sure. Okay. So then silence means uh, means no. So then thanks a lot, Jami, for the very nice yeah. talk. So then uh, we will fire up to the second one. So Ziwei. Uh, so Ziwei, by the time you are firing up, I will just uh, I will just introduce yourself. So Ziwei is currently a lecturer in, at Northeastern University, China. His research interests include real-time based systems, 
CPS and the time sensitive network. So this work is titled rerouting and rescheduling of the time triggered balls for fault tolerance in time sensitive networking. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you see the, my slides? Yes, perfect. Okay, so, okay, uh, great. Uh, I'm Joe Feng Kong from Northeastern University, and our paper is online rerouting and rescheduling of time trigger flows for fault tolerance and time sensitive networking. And the aim of our paper is to recover the reliability when some of fault occurs. So, uh, I will introduce my paper, our paper in the following five parts. Uh, Jason is short for the time sensitive networking and uh, and our paper is focused on the latency plans, which is I mean, for QVV standard and also for the reliability standard or CB. Uh, QVV is also meant for the time of wire shaper. That means uh, in each uh, in each port, uh, it has uh, eight gates, and each gate is connected with a gate. Uh, each, each queue is connected with a gate, and the gate has two states. One is open, and another is closed. When the gate is open, the uh, buffer in the queue can be transmitted to the next one. While the gate is closed, the transmission cannot be allowed. Uh, the, the gate's behavior is time trigger and is radically repeated uh, uh, in the uh, period. The transmission is non preemption. Well, uh, the CB is also named for frame replication and limitation for reliability. Also, for FIY, the aim of uh, CB is to cite. Duplicates, uh, duplicate copies of each frame over uh, multiple different passes. Uh, for example, the frames are replicated at the source and transmitted through uh, the separate passes to the destination. And at the destination, the duplicates are illimited. Well, one reason is, uh, one question is that uh, the, reliability, the reliability is decreased when any link is broken. So how to, uh, so our paper is to extend the static of the approach of FRI to have all incremental routing and rescheduling functions that can recover the reliability when the uh, thing occurs. Uh, in our algorithm, then it can hold up two phases, two phases, one is offline, uh, that can grant you the reliability when the network is set up. And when there is online phase, it can recover the uh, reliability online. So, so I'm going to illustrate the step from online phase. And we will see uh, the operators in the network have the same batteries. Well, I need mean to say that the same batteries are just for the, this example. And I will can use multiple services. The thing at one is from going to from uh, from V1 to V8, and we say that the network reliability requirement can be assumed to tolerate at least one permanent and transition frame respectively. So in offline, the first step is that we collect three redundant passes for F1. And we choose the shortest passes, uh, such as the green one and the red one. And next, we locate a uh, time slot or a size for the uh, message that can transmit through the different disjoint passes. And it can receive at the width eight. And last, the last translating. Standard rate of reserve for the online phase. Okay, so occurs and maybe the reliability is decreased. And how to recover the reliability is uh, in our paper, we have two steps one is rerouting and another is rescheduling. Uh, in the rescheduling, then we find the oldest feasible link at the to transmit the 
to the flow, assuming that the path and the schedule from the certain flow stay fixed and cannot be modified. For example, uh, there are two flows, R, uh, F1 and F2 are existing flows, and in the same F3, then we scheduled flow if runs the feeder flow and need to be retransmitted. Uh, re yeah, and we can also assume all the flows have this uh, same queue. Yeah, and F1 and F3 are existing flows, so that they're outside or the transmission windows that cannot be modified. It's here that we need to select the field row outside for F3 to transmit on V1 when we want to V3. So F3 cannot be set here because it comes into um, comes over living over with F1. Yeah. The, next, uh, the next upside, the F3 set here, but it also can cross interleaving with F2. But interleaving is that the different transmission order that can uh, uh, between the run device and deliver from the device. For example, that V3, uh, sorry, F2 and F3 run at V3 at the same time, but the different transmission order, such as F3, F2, or F2, F3, that makes the transmission uh, non deterministic and can maybe cause the uh, delay increase. So the timing control cannot be granted in, time, in TSN. So in some paper that we uh, propose to, uh, Good solution to avoid interleaving. One is to cite different queues, and another is to cite not overlapping time storm to transmit these two flows that share similar uh, same switch. So for this idea, we find the uh, outside of three to transmit it. So um, for this idea, we can find all of sides in each link and it around all the times and during the other period. But one question also is that we in this step we also to side the side the outside to transmit the um reader flow, but how to choose the pass uh, in the speaker that we additively select the pass with the minimum birth case and to end delay to allocate outside. And we need to say that the pass is the uh, is in the uh outside that collected in the F1 phase. So we next step is to need to um, estimate the worst rate delay of the considered flow. So we need to know the interference. In two cases, uh, to transmit F, uh, the considered flow, such as FI, that they have the same queue in the case one and the different queues in uh, case two. Well, the worst cases that the inferences can be summarized in the, the procedure flow itself and the interference on same link and the other links. So then we can use the fixed point surf on the policy that can obtain the work rate delay from the first link to the left link. And then we summarize the work rate, uh, the odd delay in the route that we can finally can obtain the worst case end to end delay of F5. Yeah, um, in this, uh, this slide, that uh, we summarize our online phase that uh, when a payment flow occurs, that uh, we first remove the fail link and extend the worst case end to end delay and uh, removing the slide pass. Uh, and it's the slide pass uh, with the shortest delay. Well, if it can be scheduled, then uh, the offsite can, uh, uh, can be assigned. Successfully, well, if it failed, then we sign messages, copies on the duplicate passes with also with the minimum delay and locate time slot with the in the uh, route. Yeah. Uh, in this paper, we use DOR to metric our reliability level. The DOR is the degree of redundancy. For the planning fault, the DOR is the number of redundant passes. And for the transient fault, it's the number of redundant. Redundant message copies. So in uh, after online recovery, there are two cases. One is to use a destroying process to transmit uh, the failure flow that both the of permanent and transient fault can be recovered. And in case two, that we use the uh, duplicate 
way to translate the filter flow that the only DNA for traceable blocks can be recovered. And uh, our experiment shows that no matter the minimum DNA or the average DNA that our, our algorithm shown down, screen length or blue line is better than the state of art um, shown as the green line. We also compare the assignment ratio that um, it, um, that our, our algorithm showing that screen is better than the state of art GMS in green. Well, it's a little bit lower than the NLP method. NLP is uh, that that is because NLP is the optimal uh, solution that so ever is heuristic solution. So it's a little bit lower than the NLP method. So thank you. Cool. So uh so audience, uh do you have any questions before I ask my own question? <laughs> Perfect. So then uh, maybe I will start with my question. So I have a question actually on page 19. So page 19 of your slides. Yes, yeah, thank you. So the thing that is a little bit unclear from my side is about your estimation of the worst end-to-end -end delay. So is this kind of estimation also take time? And what are you going to compensate on all these kind of so the computation also takes time, and the, how are you going to compensate all these? So, so for a step, for the offline thing, I can fully buy it, but for the online phase, uh, computing the worst case end-to-end -end delay, are you setting up some assumptions in terms of uh, in terms of all these kind of estimations? Okay, yeah, uh, we uh, we use the fixed point. A search that if it it has the terminant a uh, terminant condition that if it larger than the deadline or uh, yeah if larger than deadline it can the procedure is a uh, terminant. So I think the the computation is uh not time consuming in our scenario. Well, so it also well another solution is that we can extract it to use all the passes and we uh, we side on side in any of the passes as well so can be the solution but uh okay uh, allocate of sizes uh we need to search all the uh, flows or the uh nodes and all the time uh, time slots so it's a little bit time consuming maybe uh, time consuming then uh, consider the worst case delay. Yeah. So I will uh, uh, I really work with not very long by the way. So maybe in the long network it contains uh many solutions that maybe the um uh, uh, the worst case delay can be a little bit time consuming in online. Cool. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot, Zui. So thanks a lot for uh, your thank you. Uh, any other question from the audience? Then if not, thanks Zui again for this very nice talk. So then we'll move on to uh, Manish. So is Manish online? So just so, want to- uh, Unfortunately, Manish uh, uh, couldn't be present uh, here right now. Um, I'm his advisor, Sridhar. Uh, if you can play the backup video, that would be great. And I will answer all the questions. Okay, cool. So then, uh, maybe the the, the room assistant, uh, please just fire up uh, the video. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Manish Goyal. Uh, I welcome you all to the presentation of our work on provable and guided state space exploration of cyber physical systems using sensitivity approximation. This is a joint work with Mihir Ulhas Devaskar and Parasra Sridhar Dubirana. <clears throat> a cyber physical system involves the integration of software with embedded control system, where this integrated system uh, interacts with the physical environment. 
we have numerous cps examples all around us such as airplanes unmanned aerial vehicles medical monitoring smart grid autonomous cars including their miniature version called f110 Although they have garnered a lot of interest in the last two decades, cyber vehicle system or such software operated systems have been in use for quite some time. But most of them uh, are deployed in safety critical applications. So there have been mishaps and it comes at a cost, right? But for every failure, there has been a success story uh, where a software operated system either saved a system from crashing or in, even saved a life. So it is imperative to invest efforts, not just into the design of CPS, but also in the analysis. But analyzing a cyber physical system is challenging for two particular reasons. First is the system complexity. As the system complexity is advanced, a uh, control algorithm also becomes complex, right? And at the same time, uh, increasing government regulatory requirements uh, and functional specification, which primarily includes safety and efficiency, are also becoming complex. So people use two types of techniques uh, to analyze the cyber physical system, primarily two. Uh, so one is reachability analysis. Uh, such tools tend to compute an over approximation of the reachable set, but computing such over approximation uh, is hard and is computationally expensive. At the same time, if we have nonlinear dynamics, if the constraints are nonlinear, objective function is nonlinear, then that also adds to the complexity uh, of the system, right? And in this work, we look at neural network control systems. On the other hand, falsification, uh, which is a slightly weaker notion, uh, tends to find a counterexample if it exists. A falsification tool uh, performs stochastic optimization, but it is not geared towards exploring the street fits in a guided manner. And they also do not provide convergence guarantees. So the question we ask in this presentation or for our work is whether we can exploit some system properties uh, in order to perform systematic and provable state space exploration. Uh, the system property uh, that we look at in our work is called sensitivity, uh, which has two notions. One is forward sensitivity, which is the vector difference uh, between trajectories at time t. Right, this phi v, as you can see. And inverse sensitivity is the notion of sensitivity in inverse time, uh, which gives us the perturbation required to displace the trajectory by v at specific time t. So this is inverse sensitivity for us, for v. Once we have a sensitivity function, uh, its gradient gives the direction for the trajectory to move at a specific time as a result of small change in the initial condition. This delta v here is the sensitivity gradient, or we can also uh, call it directional derivative. And the magnitude of the perturbation is determined by a scaling factor s. So uh, we use neural network to learn this sensitivity function, either the gradient or sensitivity or its direction. Then we use this learned neural network to perform state space exploration, which is to reach a given state at a given time t. We are also able to provide a bound on the number of iterations needed for convergence of our state space exploration algorithm. So for a given state space, uh, we sample a fixed number of trajectories and use this trajectory to form the input and output pair for the neural network. We feed these input output pairs to the neural network so that it can learn a given sensitivity function or inverse sensitivity in our work. So once we have an approximation of the sensitivity function uh, in the form of neural network, we perform state space exploration, where we start with an anchor trajectory and a given destination state at time t and see how far this anchor trajectory is at time t from the destination. We use that vector uh, to find an approximation of the inverse sensitivity in the initial state. And we move in that direction uh, by a specified amount. And the next trajectory that we sample after moving in that direction gives us the new anchor and we go on from there. So the algorithm continues until uh, we reach the destination or some specified neighborhood around the destination. So NXC provides a lot of feature uh, where we can either customize like at what frequency do we need to sample the anchor trajectory or what should be the scaling factor by what perturbation should we move in that direction or uh, they a designer can also customize the direction in which they want to move, right? So in this example, uh, 
in the left hand side we sample anchor after each iteration whereas on the right hand side we sample anchor after three iteration of the neural network approximation of inner sensitivity as you can see we are able to reach the destination much faster if we increase the frequency of the course correction but the more course correction we do at one time uh, that means like we incur more error A reachability analysis uh, demands that we stay within the initial set uh, for a given initial condition, right? So it may happen that when we sample a new initial state uh, after getting the inverse sensory approximation, it may turn out to be outside the initial set. So what we do is we project that initial state, which is outside the initial set, uh, back to the initial set on its boundary, and we take that uh, new anchor from there and then continue. As you can see, our algorithm uh, is able to satisfy this initial condition. As it hits the boundary, it makes a detour and continues from there. Uh, by default, we move in the direction of the destination, but control designer, based on their insights, they may decide to look at the inverse sensitivity for a specific direction, right? So our NXG framework allows the control designer to specify some customized direction that they are interested in exploring. Uh, the left hand side uh, figure is the default algorithm. Whereas if we decide to move in the axis aligned directions, that's how our state space exploration algorithm would perform. We can also use our state space exploration algorithm to perform uh, some sort of set coverage analysis. Uh, I won't go into the details, but for a given approximation of some reachable set at time t, we can sample a number of states in that, and then see how many states in there in those sample ones are reachable by our state space exploration algorithm. So this gives us some insight on like how good or bad the approximation of the reachable set is, and also tells us like how good our algorithm is in order to find how many states are reachable. So on the left hand side, we have a course approximation of the reachable set, but in the right hand side figure, it's much compact uh, representation of the reachable set. That's why uh, almost like 185 states out of 200 are reachable. And finally, falsification, uh, where the objective is to find a counter example if it exists. S. Tellero is one of the most widely used uh, falsification tool for cyber physical system. It performs stochastic optimization based on a metric called robustness, which is to determine how far or how much in the unsafe set the execution is. As you can see, it performs this uh, stochastic optimization. That's why uh, the sampled initial states are all over the place in the initial set. Whereas NXG, uh, it performs falsification in a much guided manner and is able to find a falsifying execution uh, much faster as compared to a standard. And our evaluation uh, also exhibit that NXG achieves a considerable performance gain, both in terms of number of iterations, as well as the robustness of the counter example. A designer can also use NXG for obtaining an execution for suboptimal performance specification. Suppose they are interested in finding an execution in the neighborhood of the unsafe set. Given how guided this NXG uh, framework is, we are able to find such execution uh, much faster. And it may happen that s because of its stochastic nature, may not obtain the counterexample even after 100, 200 iterations, right? But whatever the best trajectory it gives, it's still better than some random trajectory. So we can use that best trajectory uh, as our reference starting anchor trajectory uh, in order to perform state space exploration and be able to find a counterexample much quicker. So NXT can supplement an existing falsification tool. This is the convergence theorem, uh, where the bound on the number of iterations is a function of uh, scaling factor, course correction, gamma, which is a function of system, and the neighborhood around Z, and how much distance we started off with. Uh, without going into details, the takeaways are, our state space expression procedure terminates even if we only have an access to an approximation of the sensitivity function. And the rate of convergence of our algorithm is linear in the number of system iterations. So in this work, uh, we showed how we can use neural network to learn sensitivity function of complex cyber physical systems. 
we use that learned sensory approximation to perform guided state space exploration and we could also provide convergence guarantees under some assumptions since we looked at only a class of STL specification, uh, one of the future works is to look at the extension to general class of STL specification and to also analyze a large scale design such as F16 collision avoidance system. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any question you may have. Cool. So, so then, uh, is there any questions directly on the on the on uh, Para Sarah? I hope I pronounced the name right. Yeah, I go by Sridhar and uh, yeah, thanks for the, uh, uh, thanks for uh, playing the backup video. Uh, I just want to supplement that uh, uh, in the paper, we explicitly thanked Professor Oded Mahler, who is no longer with us. Um, uh, he was one of the inspirations for this work. So yeah, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. So maybe I can just start with one. So what? So one thing that is a little bit unclear from my side is about uh, the convergence. And uh, so because you actually in the page nine of the presentation, there is this so-called course correction. So this mm -hmm. seems to to be somewhat like inhibiting that, uh, for example, the sensitive inverse sensitivity that you learn from the neural network is not really working well. So the convergence guarantee, why isn't it somehow like related to the 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 frequency of course correction? So I didn't based on the theorem that is, it is stated, it seems that uh, if I, for example, never do course correction, uh, how can I guarantee convergence? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a deep question, actually. So um, the, the, the fundamental uh, point here is that when we approximate the inverse sensitivity using neural network, the neural network can be incorrect. So um, the, if, if there is an entity which is called an oracle, which will tell us the exact direction to move the initial state so that your trajectory goes closer to the destination. That is the ideal, uh, that's the ideal uh, oracle, right? However, we don't have access to oracle, but instead our neural network is an approximation and it will take the trajectory in a, in a, in a direction that is slightly off, right? So if you purely trust a neural network and use the inverse sensitivity approximation, and if you run it, it run, let it run its course, then because you have learned the inverse sensitivity incorrectly, you will reach a, reach, a, reach a state which is not the destination, right? So the course correction are an important part of this process, which will tell you how far you have moved from the destination. And the course correction is actually a, a, a part of this also because, again, the reason why course correction occurs in the convergence theorems is that the, the difference between the trajectory after the course correction versus the ideal oracle trajectory, that the distance between those two is a function of the system property, which is how much convergence and divergence happens in the system trajectories. And also um, it's also a function of how much time or how, how far apart are the initial trajectory from the course correction. So the, um, the short answer is that we have to do course correction because we don't learn the exact sensitivity and we learn only an approximation of it. And course correction occurs in the convergence theorem bounds because the amount of recorrection that you need to do is depending uh, is is a function of how far you have moved from the ideal trajectory which goes closer to the destination Got it. so uh, so i think that i got it wrong in the in the presentation of page 14 because uh, he didn't mention about the the course correction in the in the convergence theorem so i was a little bit surprised yeah, uh, so I think I, because I think naturally you should have something in that, otherwise it doesn't work. I'll say. Yeah, so S P P is the number of course correction vectors. Yeah, so oh, S P. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So then, uh, any other questions? If not, then uh, thanks a lot for this talk and thanks for staying with us, and we can move on to the final talk. So final talk, uh, Bing Yao. So maybe you can grab up your screen. Uh, but during this time, I will try to give an introduction to you. So Bing Yao is currently a PhD student at the University of British Columbia. His research interests are in systems, particularly OS design and implementation and security. The time is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning and evening, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. I'm Jerry Bing Yao Wang from the Systopia Lab at the University of British Columbia. 
So today I'm thrilled to present our work, TinkerToy, which is an open source collection of components that lets you build a custom operating system for tiny IoT, IoT devices. We hope that you will find it a great platform on which to build exciting next generation IoT applications. So the Internet of Things has been around us for many years, and applications running on tiny devices have tremendous impact in our life, from early volcano monitoring to nowadays home automation and there remains much potential in the future. And each generation of applications impose different demands on the software infrastructure, such as event-driven sensing, multitasking, real-time scheduling. So we have different embedded operating system to address this demand. However, as the class of applications expand, how do we build system software to deal with these wildly different application requirements becomes a key challenge. Well, we could always build a unified system like Linux, but such a system will always contain features that are not needed by a particular application. And more importantly, it may not provide the right behavior as expected. So instead, we propose to build application specific operating system to meet application demands. But writing such a system from scratch is too burdensome. So our work presents TinkerToy, a collection of standard operating system modules from which developers can assemble a custom kernel for IoT devices. And not only does the assembled kernel provide precisely the functionality needed by a particular application, but it also consumes up to four times less memory footprint than other popular IoT operating system and without performance penalty at runtime. So currently, TinkerToy provides these 10 modules that are sufficient to run simple user programs and demonstrate our design concept. The assembled kernel does not change the view of an operating system from the perspective of user application, which always requests services from the kernel by invoking system calls. And the context feature preserves the execution context and jumps to the kernel. The dispatcher figure out which service is being requested and select the kernel service routine to process that request. Kernel service routines implement system calls or respond to device interrupt. And they may ask the scheduler to rearrange the task order if necessary. And finally, the control is returned to the interrupt task and the execution resumes in user space. And developers may create multiple memory allocators to provide dynamic allocated memory for both kernel and user by applications as needed. And most of these modules can be found in other conventional operating system. But TinkerToy provide them as configurable building blocks, so one can customize the behavior of each module easily. Specifically, some modules are divided into components. So developers can either switch one of those components to another, uh, to another pre-built one or assemble the component from our building blocks or even create a new component by providing their own implementation. Let's take the scheduler as example. A scheduler here is composed of three components, policy, event handler, and task constraint. The policy component manage the ready queue reflecting whether the scheduler is prioritized. So for example, we could replace a FIFO queue with a priority queue to make a prioritized scheduler. And the, the event handler component allows one to define which task event a scheduler can respond to and how it should respond. And one can assemble an event handler component from a list of standard event handler, such as those designed for a preemptive scheduler or implement a new one, for example, that demote a task on a timer interrupt. And we leverage recent C++ language features to make our building blocks and component highly reusable and composable. Specifically, some of the standard building blocks are represented as a functor, which is a C++ class that overloads the function call operator and has all the benefit of an ordinary class. We also exploit C++17's fold expression to assemble a new building block or a component from existing ones at a compile time. And as an example, the functor paper builder on this slide can build a paper from an arbitrary number of sections, each of which is a functor that returns a string. And TinkerToy offers great flexibility to developers in customizing kernel functionality, but it also uses constraints expressed in C++ concept 
to ensure that components can be assembled in a reasonable way. C++ concept allow us to specify a list of requirements on a type, such as which member function the type should provide and which operator the type should overload. For example, a priority-based scheduler must know how to reorder tasks based on their priority level. So it requires the text type to overload the three-way comparison operator. And the compiler will verify these constraints at compile time, so there is no runtime overhead at all. Our goal is to write concise and efficient code, achieving small memory footprint and high performance. So we choose these features in C++, but we want to emphasize that C++ is not the only choice. And in fact, any languages that provide the right features will be fine. For example, Rust is gaining popularity in system programming and its type trick mechanism provides functionality similar to C++ concept. And finally, once developers finish customizing each component, they assemble the module back from these components and similarly assemble the kernel from those modules. And that's the core design concept of Tinkertoy. We want to know how much effort it takes one to assemble a custom kernel for a particular IoT application and how the memory footprint and runtime performance compared to other popular IoT operating system. So we built an automatic watering system that requires three different kinds of kernel, a monitor kernel for applications that fetch the soil monitor level and an actuator kernel for applications that controls the water gate and a gateway kernel for applications that act as a transparent proxy, translating co-app messages to HTTP messages and vice versa. And we choose these three kernels carefully to reflect first and second generation sensor network operating system and emerging third generation system that runs on intelligent IoT devices. We were able to assemble these kernel in less than 200 lines of code and most components are assembled from building blocks in a few lines of code, but we must implement the mapper to connect system call to their corresponding kernel service routines. And the rest of the kernel is dominated by the interrupt service routine and the bootloader, and Tinkertoy does not yet provide building blocks for them, and we are actively, actively engaged in making it easier for developers to write device drivers and the boot sequence. We measure the flash and the memory footprint and find that the assembled kernels on average consume four times less, mem uh, less memory than other popular IoT operating system because all the data structures and functions in the assembled kernel are designed specifically for a particular application. And therefore, there's no unused code at all. And as an example, a task control block is 12 bytes in Tinkertoy's monitor kernel but 64 bytes in FreeRTOS and 112 bytes in Zephyr. There are four event handlers registered on the system, so it is not a surprise that other systems require more memory. And we also measure the runtime performance of our gateway kernel by calculating the amount of time it takes the application to translate a single co-app message, and the result shows that the assembled kernel does not have performance penalty. And there are many avenues for future work, such as adding support for multi-threaded kernels, providing device drivers, exploiting hardware isolation mechanism, and synthesizing kernel modules with respect to former specification. We demonstrate that it is possible to design system components and assemble realistic open system in this manner. And once we have more building blocks, we believe that TinkerDrive will be suitable for a richer set of applications. So that's TinkerDrive. Build your own operating system for IoT devices. And this research is conducted under the supervision of Dr. Margaret Seltzer at the Sisto Bay Lab, University of British Columbia. Thanks for joining us today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Cool. So, yep. So then, uh, please, uh, I saw the ordering none. Uh, please, you can ask your first question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I think this is a very nice piece of work and also a very nice presentation. I'm very impressed. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, I mean, so my impression is uh, like building a, a, a art house with this elegant structure, which you can uh, easily compose it. 
without a significant performance penalty, this is the dream of a lot of people, right? Uh, so my question is, can you summarize or outline what is the essential challenge when you are doing this work? Or in other words, like let's suppose if somebody else also want to do this, at which key point they could be do uh, they could did wrong, but you 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 did it correctly. That's a great question. Uh, thank you. So um, I would say there are two main aspects or two challenge of this work. The first is the design and the uh, the design of the module is, uh, in other words, is the composition, the composition of the kernel into these small pieces. And the second one is the uh, selecting the correct language features in C++ uh, in, in one specific case. Uh, the first one is uh, we need to specify the interface between each modules because even though we allow the developers to assemble however they want, we have to maintain the correctness of the interface. And we use C++ concept to guarantee that. And the second one is C++ is kind of like a, a really dangerous uh, dangerous programming languages because if misused, the it will be catastrophic. For example, our first version of the scheduler use uh, virtual functions and multi-inheritance and as a result, the virtual function table is a significant overhead on such a tiny devices because our emulation board has only eight kilobytes memory. And guess what? The virtual function table and the, the V table and the constructor destructor for our scheduler consume four kilobytes. And that's 50% of the memory. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I saw that uh, there is a David, uh, you want to ask a question, right? Please. Yes, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, I, I was wondering, you, you, you mentioned something about that you can interact with other kind of modules from other languages and environments. You, know, you said something about Rust. And, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that and, and requirements, what kind of languages and runtimes and where, where are the limitations right now? So uh, this is, well, uh, this work requires four, four uh, language features is to capture the generis, uh, genericity of the kernel modules. And we need some uh, runtime, yeah, runtime guarantee to impose the constraint on the type itself. And the, we also want to compose the final code at compile time because our building blocks allows ones to customize the kernel functionality at code level. And the, well, in system programming languages, we have limited choice, C, C++, and Rust. And C, of course, in this case, uh, cannot satisfy or need. And Rust, as I mentioned, its type trick uh, functionality is similar to the C++ uh, concept, but Rust doesn't support inheritance. So at this moment, we, we cannot use Rust to uh, assemble these building blocks because some of the assembling uh, class use actually use the private inheritance uh, inheritance provided by the C++. So we are still exploring the design and implementation if we choose Rust to implement these building blocks. Does that clarify okay. your question? Okay, so, so it's not possible with the current. I, I thought you said that it was you could connect uh, with Rust, but then it's a limitation right now that it is not possible together with the Rust. If I yes, and we are still exploring the design and implementation in Rust. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Cool. So, uh, so maybe we can uh, we can go for the last two questions, and you answer it in one minute. So the first one is from Nicolo. He actually he or she actually asked about which platform supports. Do you now support uh, at the moment by Tinker Tinker Toy, and uh, this is his question and uh, or her question and my question is actually uh, I found that the constraint that you specify they are very local between layers and it's somehow like I'm clear from my side why this kind of cross layer constraint doesn't exist and uh, so so what's uh, what makes it so I can think I can. Uh, I, I, I cannot really buy the, the, the relation that uh, all the constraints seems to be local between layers. And uh, so, so maybe, maybe you can just simply say that, well, this is the case. Uh, so two questions. First, which sure. platforms are supported? The second so, is about local constraints. So right now, our Tinker type module support ARM Cortex M3, and we do not have device driver at this moment. So if we want to use that, we have to write the device driver, the boot sequence, all the architecture specific and the platform specific code by ourselves. So we have another research project that works on uh, the device driver synthesis, which is 
leveraging the, uh, the syn uh, program synthesis technique from the programming languages field and the strategic planning in the uh, video game uh, video game and artificial uh, intelligence to make it easier to synthesize the device driver with respect to the formal specification. That's the first question. And the, uh, the second question is, the constraints are, every, uh, are everywhere, and some of them are local to this particular specific module or even building block, but some of the constraints uh, like, like like this one, the prioritizable constraint is specific to the uh, scheduler. But we do have some constraint like uh, for for the cross bound uh, cross uh, for for the interaction between each module. For example, uh, in a dispatcher or your kernel service routine, you may you, you may ask the scheduler to rearrange the task order, and you, you do so by calling the corresponding event handler of the scheduler. And and we have the constraint or the concept to specify that your custom scheduler indeed provide this interface. For example, if your system support task termination and your scheduler has to provide the implementation of the task termination event handler. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So thanks a lot. So then uh, with this four wonderful talks, we can close this session. I don't really know if we have another one afterwards. Uh, if not, then we can close now. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.